Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. Thank you for the revelation that you're bringing forth as we are sharing the important subject of redemption. Thank you for all that you accomplished today. We praise you for the truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're sharing with you on the important subject of redemption. We've talked about the plan of redemption, about the creation. We talked about creation of man. We talked about the fall of Lucifer because of being jealous. We talked about the fall of man who disobeyed and gave the authority into the hands of Satan. We talked about the work that God accomplished in bringing forth what he purposed to bring forth the the revelation of what his plan was. And remember, this is a plan that was hidden in God. And we see that in Genesis 3.15, after the fall of man, this is what he said to Satan. He said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Talking about the seed was going to bruise his head and break his lordship over mankind. And yet at the same time, Satan would bruise his heel, which speaks of the crucifixion, that he was going to die. Of course, the devil thought that that was all that he needed to do. Remember what we've talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 7. This was a hidden mystery, wisdom that was hidden from everyone. Satan did not know about this whatsoever. Verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the age. The word world, if you're here for the first time in the lower window, we bring up information. This is the word aeon, which means age, not world. The world is the word cosmos. Before the age unto our glory, which none of the princes, this means the rulers of this age, knew. If they'd have known, and this is talking about all the ones who were ruling with Satan and all his evil spirits operating under him. If they'd have known what was this mystery, this plan, this thing that was hidden, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We've gone through many messages. We've talked about how it was important and what God had to do, how he had to die in order to accomplish 20 major things that we went through. We also talked about the chronology of last week of Jesus, we pointed out the fact that Jesus died on Wednesday and then was raised spiritually from the dead on Saturday after three days and three nights and then bodily resurrected on the first day of the week as we've seen all these things. And of course we pointed out that Easter is a lie, Easter is all about paganism and also we talked about the timing of the birth of Jesus that was important to understand that he was born in 5 BC and then this died in 30 BC, which, excuse me, 30 AD, which is important for us to understand in regards to the church age. We also talked about what happened from the cross to the throne, the things that we saw. And we also talked about in the last time together, the high priestly ministry of Jesus, what he is doing now. So what we've seen is all the things of what he did. But now it's important for you to understand how he was able to do this and why it was necessary for him to do the things that he did and understand the ongoing work of redemption. It wasn't just a one thing, one time thing and then it's all over. No, it is an ongoing work as you will see. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of important things today that really brings forth the reality of what he's accomplished is he had to do this according to spiritual law. We see this in Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23 and verse 11. He says, For their Redeemer is mighty, he shall plead their cause with thee. The word plead is a word which refers to conducting a case or a suit legally. He is conducting a legal case of redemption. He just wasn't just doing whatever God wanted to do. Spiritual law rules everything. God doesn't do anything contrary to the Word. The Word is the way, what He's going to carry out. And in order to accomplish the redemption, 
He had to do things according to spiritual law. So the Redeemer is going to conduct a legal case to accomplish all the things that needed to be done for accomplishing redemption. Now, we see in Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah 52, remember that Adam disobeyed. In doing so, he committed treason against God. He gave the authority into the hands of Satan. Now, Jesus is going to do something about it, which is God in Christ. Notice what he says here in Isaiah 52, verse 3. For thus saith the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. They didn't know anything about that because they were used to just redeeming things by paying money for recovering of land or possessions. Now he's saying, you're going to be redeemed, but it's not going to be with money whatsoever. Then we go to Psalms 49, and we see an important point brought out. Psalms 49, in verse 7. He says, none of them, talking about man, can by any means redeem his brother. No man could do it because he was in a spiritually dead state under the dominion of Satan. Nor give to God a ransom for him. So man couldn't do anything before God to see this redemption be accomplished. But notice also what this is revealing. It is of a necessity that someone give to God a ransom for man. That meant a ransom was what was required. A ransom price had to be paid. The wages of sin is death. That meant the ransom price of one dying had to be accomplished and brought forth to God in order to accomplish the redemption. Well, could man do that? No, there's no way he could do it because of the fact that man was spiritually dead. He was not in a position to be able to bring anything to God whatsoever. It would have to be a sinless man to be able to pay the ransom price, and he would have to die. Well, because there was no man who could do that, who, who could accomplish this? It was only God. God's the only one who could accomplish this. But because a man was involved in the fall, it had to be a man to bring forth the redemption. So that meant God had to become a man. That's why it was absolutely of a necessity. The prophecy that we have saw before, we'll look at it again. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Showing the fact that God is going to come. And how is he going to come? He's going to come through a virgin. Remember the prophecy that said about her seed. Well, that's talking about seed that would be in a woman, but the seed doesn't come from a woman. It comes from the man. Yet the woman was going to have seed. Where was the seed going to come from? From God. The Holy Spirit was going to overshadow the woman and put that seed, the Word of God, into the woman, which would bring forth the child. He's going to bear a son, and this is going to be the way that God is going to come. And who is this that's going to do this? The second person of the Godhead, the Word. John 1.14 says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is the Word who came to come into tabernacle, as this word means, to tabernacle, in a flesh now, in a physical body, to become a man, to carry out what was necessary. We see in Psalms 111. Psalms 111, we look at verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He sent this redemption. Well, who's that? That's going to be God. It's the one who's going to accomplish. He's commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. And he's going to bring forth a covenant which is going to be important to accomplish all the things that he has purposed. We see over in Luke's account. Chapter 1, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. So he's going to have to visit it. He's going to come from heaven. The Word made flesh. And he's going to accomplish this great work of redemption. Well, 
This work was going to be done by a kinsman redeemer who was going to accomplish it. We see that redemption is of such an important subject and there's two aspects of it that are extremely important to understand and they're shown in these verses that we'll be sharing with you. Jeremiah 31, verse 11. Jeremiah 31, verse 11, it says, For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. We see the word redeemed and we see the word ransomed. The first word redeemed is this word pada. Pada. And it's important to understand what this means. In this TWOT, which is the theological word book of the Old Testament, we're going to look at that so you can see this, what it says. Important for you to understand this. Number 1734, this is a tremendous program. This is the word pada. Look at the first paragraph. The basic meaning of the Hebrew is to achieve the transfer of ownership from one to another through payment of a price, which would be the ransom price. Meaning this word is talking about the transfer of ownership from one to another. After the fall of man, man was owned by the devil. He was now his spiritual father, remember, and he was under his dominion. And so this word talks about the changing and the transfer of the ownership, I mean there's going to be a purchase that is going to take place. The next word is this word ga'al. This is the word showing the active work of redemption on an ongoing basis that was accomplished at the beginning of it by what Jesus did, but is ongoing today, because it's not finished, you'll hear that as we go through this. It is ongoing and it will end up with as far as we're concerned, getting a glorified body, which we will get at the time of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. But there's also a redemption of the earth, because there's of the land as well as we, you will see, which will be an interim uh, fulfillment will be when Jesus takes back the authority and begins to rule in the earth for a thousand years, the millennial reign, but ultimately, will be when there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth because this is going to be burned up. It's not going to be here. It's going to be eliminated. This is the work that must be done. There must be an achieving of the own transfer of ownership from one to another. And when this is done, this is important to understand that this is going to result if someone becomes owned by someone else they're going to belong to them. And how do we get to that place? By becoming a firstborn. By being born from above, getting a brand new spirit as we've talked about. And Exodus 13, 2 tells us another aspect of what must be done in this work of redemption. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. When you become a firstborn, that's not over. That's not it. It's not all over. There's a sanctifying work that must be done. And the sanctifying work means to set apart, set apart as sacred, as consecrated, one who is sanctified, one who is dedicated, one who is holy. That's what must happen. And that is what the work of God that he will accomplish in us. And also this work of redemption will also ultimately end up in marriage to the Lord because at the time of the catching up of the church when we get a brand new spirit, uh, or brand new body that is, we're going to be going up to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the marriage will be between the bridegroom and the church who is the bride. For those who have met the conditions, remember, it's conditional. You have to have met the conditions in order to be in that. This word that we're talking about, this ga'al word, also that we saw about the ransom, it means to avenge, to deliver, to rescue, to bring out of slavery, to recover and restore possessions, to deliver from difficulty or danger. It has all those aspects to it. It's talking about a total restoration that would be accomplished. So what we see here, and we have another scripture to show you in Psalm 69. Psalms 69 verse 18. 
He said, draw nigh unto my soul, because our soul needs to get restored, and redeem it. This is the word ga'al, which is the work of seeing it be restored, seeing it be delivered, see the avenging, the revenging, seeing the, the deliverance come forth. It is a, a deliverance from um, coming out of slavery, be, be any kind of bondage, total healing and deliverance. Our soul needs to be set free. And then he says, and then here's the other word, pada, which means a, achieving a transfer of ownership, deliver me because of mine enemies. We got to come be delivered from the ownership of Satan and now be purchased by the Lord, which is what happens. That's why you have to understand redemption wasn't just you getting born again and then that's it. You have to understand you're bought, you're purchased. You're a purchased possession, you're bought, and now you belong unto the Lord. So redemption is that whereby a transfer of ownership from Satan, who owned man from after the fall, to God, who purchases mankind, is going to be done through this work of redemption, through a kinsman, a redeemer, who's going to come, who is God, and he's going to bring them back into relationship with God, which is what happens when we get born from above, become firstborn. And he's also going to avenge what the enemy has done to overturn all of his works, to deliver us, to heal us, to restore us, to set us free, as well as to recover and restore all possessions that have been lost and to bring a total restoration from all of the effects of the evil that has occurred. That's what God will do. Now, God does everything according to spiritual law. He just doesn't do things whenever he wants to do things just because he decides to do it. God has set his word, which is spiritual laws, the way he does everything. Now, the rights of the kinsman and redeemer are important to realize. God follows his law. Leviticus 25, we come to verse 23. He speaks about the land being redeemed. He says, the land shall not be sold forever. The land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. The land, from God's perspective, is not sold. It belongs to him. Instead, it's just been leased. That's exactly what we see when we've talked about this before, when we talked about the lease that was given to man in Luke chapter 20, Verse 9, when the parable speaking of a certain man, speaking of the Lord, planted a vineyard, let it forth to husbandmen, talking about man. And the word let means a lease. We've shown you this, and we looked at it in Freiburg's before. It means to lease or to let out something. You and I have been given, any, as far as God's perspective is, it's a lease because the land belongs unto him. So, and this is the way it is in Israel. There's it, the land has been leased, essentially. Leviticus 25, again, we go back to verse 23. The land belongs to God. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. This word here is the word gula, which means a right of redemption. A right of redemption. Meaning, if you have lost your land for some reason, you have a right of redemption to recover it and to see it come back to you. So this is a legal right of redemption that was available according to law. So we come to verse 25. If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession, any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. That means now another kinsman can redeem land or anything that's been sold. Something that's been sold can be repurchased back, be recovered. Well, Adam sold the earth and its authority and gave it into the hands of the devil, that lease that he had. It's for the period of the 6,000 year lease, remember? And a kinsman redeemer is what it's speaking. He can recover anything that's been sold meaning this one who can come can recover the forfeited inheritance of the land and recover this. Well, how's that going to happen? It's going to be God who's going to do it. Becoming a man, 
Jesus Christ, who comes to bring salvation, accomplish this redemption, the, as a kinsman redeemer, can redeem everything. He can redeem man, he can redeem the earth, he can redeem all that was lost. Now, as a ransom, this ransom that is, he now can recover as a kinsman by paying that price, we see in Leviticus 25, verse 47, If a sojourner or stranger waxed rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth him by him was poor, and sells himself unto the stranger. That's what Adam did. He sold himself to the devil. Or sojourner by thee, into the stock of the stranger's family. It says in verse 48, After that he's sold, he may be redeemed again. He can be purchased back. Even he himself was sold to someone. One of his brethren may redeem him. So, of course, man sold himself to the devil, who's the stranger, but a brethren can come along and redeem him back from him. And that's exactly what we see that Jesus is going to accomplish. We look at a scripture over in Deuteronomy chapter 7, in verse 8. Because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is what he did there back in Egypt, but it's all a type pointing towards the ultimate work that Jesus Christ is going to accomplish to redeem us out of the bondage of the devil, Pharaoh's a type of Satan, and bring us out from under the bondage to him. But this had to be done, of course, by the payment of a price. We also see to Another aspect of what the kinsman redeemer can do is to avenge the death of the kinsman by the work of an adversary. And that's what happened. Man became spiritually dead. And then he would die physically. And his destiny then was hell. He would go to hell forever in that state. We go back to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 11 again. The Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed from the hand of him that was stronger than he. He had to overcome the stronger one, and it was going to be by one who was stronger than this stronger one. And who is the stronger, stronger one who's going to overcome him? It's Jesus who's going to come. Man couldn't do it. He couldn't do anything. He was totally in bondage to the enemy. This is why Jesus came to undo the works of the enemy. We see this what it really says in 1 John 3.8, the latter part of the verse says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, not destroy that he might destroy. This is the Greek word luo, which means to loose or untie or even in this sense to undo the works of the devil. He is untied, undone, loosed the works of the devil so that they could not keep man in bondage any longer, so he could come out of it if he would do what the Word said and walk in God's ways and see him liberate him. This, of course, is the reason why Jesus, one of the reasons we already pointed out to you, why he had to go through the avenue of death, and he had to become a man, of course. Hebrews 2.14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He had to become a man as well. That through death he might, and this doesn't mean destroy either, this means to cause, to cease, and put an end to, this is this word, caro ego, to cause, to cease, and put an end to him having, this is a present tense verb, ongoingly, not that he had past tense, but having, Present tense means continuous repeated action. Having the power of death, that is the devil. And he had the power of death. Because everybody who died, everybody went to hell. Nobody went to heaven. Everybody went to hell. Including those Old Testament saints. Including the ones even that didn't even see death like Elijah and Enoch. They, they, they had to go down to hell. Why is that? And what confirms that? Well, John chapter 3, verse 13, makes the statement, No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. Nobody. 
where did they go? They went to the upper compartment of hell, a place of, of comfort in Abraham's bosom. They were not in torment, talking about the Old Testament saints, while the evil ones, the unrighteous, went to the lower pit, and they were in torment. But no man could go up to heaven. But the good news is Jesus went through the the avenue of death, to get to him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And we see then over in Hosea, something important to see, in verse 13. Verse 14. He said, I will ransom them. This is the word pada, the achieving the transfer of ownership. That's what was necessary in order to get them delivered from the power of the, not the grave, physical. This is the word Sheol, which means hell. Should have been translated hell. I will redeem them from death. Otherwise, they're not going to be under the power of death any longer because of Satan. He's to, Jesus is going to take back the keys of hell and death, which, is, of course, is what he accomplished. Now, remember, they went to hell. And the problem, of course, was that was their destiny. In fact, we looked at verse 14, but verse 15 goes on in Hebrews 2 and says, Deliver them who through fear of death. They had a fear of death because they knew where they're going to end up. They're going to be in hell for ongoing were all their lifetime subject to bondage unto slavery, this means. They were under slavery because they were spiritually dead. Satan was the spiritual father. He was the ruler over the world system. He's the one who had them in bondage. So, somebody had to do something here. And it was Jesus, of course, who accomplished this. Now, let's go back to Leviticus. You must understand that Jesus is the one who is going to come and liberate us from everything. And in Leviticus chapter 25, where we see about the redeeming from the land or redeeming from being sold or possessions lost, you need to understand when this happened on an ongoing basis during the Old Testament era. In Leviticus 25 verse 9, then shalt thou cause the tr trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement you shall make a trumpet sound throughout all your land. This is the jubilee. The jubilee sound was on the tenth day of the seventh month every fifty years. You shall hallow the fiftieth year. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man to his possession. You shall return every man unto his family. Otherwise, if he had lost possessions, if he had been sold, purchased by somebody else, he could come back to the family, he could regain his possession, he could regain his land. This was done every 50 years. Remember, everything in the Old Testament that was done physically was pointing towards the spiritual realities that would be accomplished by Jesus Christ when He come. So every 50 years was a reminder to them, and they would get restored back, but then they could go right back in bondage again. Every 50 years was pointing towards the fulfillment of the Jubilee. And we already pointed out to you that the time of man's rule, as we have seen, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, when God saw that man was wicked and he was decided he was going to kill them all in the flood, but one man found grace in his sight, who was Noah, because he had obeyed, he was seen righteous in his sight, remember? Genesis 6, 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Now, they lacked something here in the King James because there's another word here, and it means going astray and erring. That's why, as Young's brings out, in their erring, which means they sinned, their flesh, meaning they're not spirit right with God anymore. They still have a spirit, but their spirit's spiritually dead. They're now flesh. They're not, up, they're not in relationship with God. So he didn't, he's tired of striving with man, basically. I'm not going to really strive with man, these ones. Yet, and why? Because this is at the time when he's going to bring forth the flood and destroy them all. 
Notice what he said. He said, yet his days shall be 120 years. That's not talking about the lifespan because we talked about Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael and all the ones that lived beyond that. This is talking about 120 jubilee years, which is the time that man would rule. A year from God's standpoint was every 50 years. A 50-year period was a period as a year that he considered. And so 120 50-year periods is 6,000 years. And that is the 6,000 years, the man's rule, of the 7,000-year existence of the earth. And the earth is only going to exist for 7,000 years. All those that say millions of years and all that, it's all a lie. <laughs> it's all false. 2 Peter 3, 8. Beloved, be ignorant of this thing, that one day, only one day, so you don't think it's more than a 24-hour period, only one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as only one day. There were seven days in the creation, six days, which points towards the 6,000 years, and then the seventh day, which is the thousand years that he would then, he would reign for the 7,000 year period. We also see that it spoke continually about man could work for six days, but not on the seventh day, the Sabbath was a continual reminder pointing towards the, the fact that there was going to be one coming who was going to be ruling and they would not be able to do any work to be working out anything in their life after those six days. Man had 6,000 years to work out his salvation and to walk in the ways of the Lord. But after that it was over because the judgment comes upon the church at the end and then Jesus will take back control of the earth as we will see, which this is yet to happen. This will happen after the lease is over, after the 6,000 years, and then he will begin to rule for a thousand years. So this is the 7,000 year. And let's go back to Leviticus now. So this is talking about the time of the Jubilee. And who is the one who is the, the comes and brings the fulfillment of that? Jesus does. So we come to a verse, we saw in verse 25, we go to verse 26. If the man has, has have none to redeem it, and himself be able to redeem it, otherwise if, he, if no one else can redeem him, but himself has the ability to redeem it, then it says, then let that... Let him count the years of the sale thereof, restore the overplus in the man to whom it was sold, and he may return to his possession. Meaning the man himself could do it. But the point from that is, that means that if there was a man who could do it, then he, he could bring the restoration. And that's exactly what happens with Jesus, because Jesus gets in the state that man is in, in a spiritually separated state with all the sins laid upon him, and he then could accomplish the redemption himself because remember man could not do it because he was bound by Satan, spiritually dead. So it could be done. We see, come to verse 28. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall go out and he shall return unto his possession. So. That shows us that the Jubilee is the time when there's a return. Oh, this Jubilee happened every 50 years, but remember, there's two fulfillments of the Jubilee by Jesus Christ. The first fulfillment is when he comes, because he comes and he begins his ministry on the day of Jubilee, which was the seventh month, tenth day, which we've talked about. He began his ministry, Luke chapter 4, Verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What's the acceptable year of the Lord? Jubilee. Everybody goes free. Now Jesus was bringing forth, as he accomplished what was necessary to bring forth the firstborn, to bring forth the new birth, bring man to the place where he could be born from above and come into relationship with him. 
But remember, redemption is not just that one act. It's ongoing. And this shows the ongoing act of Jesus, our jubilee, who has come. He's bringing the gospel. He's bringing healing. He's bringing deliverance. He's bringing liberty, bringing freedom. And this is the fulfillment of his work, as it talks about in Isaiah chapter 61, part of it, not all of it. There's another part that is going to be fulfilled. So that was in Jesus' first coming, and it goes on through the earth, through the earth, the church age. He's continuing this redeeming, ongoing work of restoring us, healing us, delivering us, setting us free. But there's another aspect to what he's going to do. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, opening the prison to them that are bound, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the year of Jubilee, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now oh, that's another aspect. Jesus didn't come to do that in his first coming. He only came to bring salvation and to bring the beginning aspect of the Jubilee. But there's another aspect. And that's going to be the taking back of the earth. And that's where he's going to bring the vengeance of our God, which is going to be the judgment that is going to come. Now, we must understand that there's three important things that the Lord would have to have to accomplish what he needs to do it, according to spiritual law. He couldn't do it without doing it according to spiritual law. Number one, he had to have the right of redemption. Number two, he had to have the right of the possession of the inheritance. He had to have the right. Number three, he had to have the right of exchanging of the ownership of something. How could he accomplish this? This is seen when we look at Ruth and at Jeremiah. First, we will look at Ruth. If you haven't heard the series on Ruth, you need to hear it. It is totally different probably than anything you've ever heard because it's not talking about some love story, you know. No, it's talking about redemption. It is very important to understand. We're going to look at a few of the verses to show this. Remember that there was a problem where there was a famine in Israel and, and Elimelech, Elimelech and Naomi and their sons, Balaam and Chilion, they all left and they went to Moab which was not good, and they found wives there. And then, because they went to the wrong place, they all died out. Elimelech died, and then the sons died. And then here, all there was was Naomi and the two wives. One of them went back to Moab, and the other one, Ruth, she stuck with her. And here, when she came, we're picking up here in Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, talking about Ruth, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi said to her, the man's near of kin to us. He's one of our next kinsmen. <clears throat> so this is talking about a kinsman who could accomplish redemption. She wanted to get the redemption of the land back. But there was more than that as well. It had to raise up the name of the dead in order to bring forth their continuing family line. So, notice what he says. <clears throat> He's not a, this is a prophetic statement. He left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. That means redemption not only affected the living who were alive, but also affected the dead. Who would that be? All the dead and saints, the ones that were in the upper compartment of hell, who were going to be liberated from that. They were in Abraham's bosom. But it affected even those that were dead. Remember, the gospel was preached to the spirits in prison, 1 Peter 3, 19. We looked at that and how the gospel was preached to those that were dead, 1 Peter 4, 6, so they could be judged with those that are living. He preached the gospel to Jesus did after he had accomplished what he had done down in hell, paying the price and then being the firstborn from spiritual death to spiritual life. So this means that redemption affects not only the living, but also all those Old Testament saints as well. Now when it speaks about here about <clears throat> this next kinsman, it's this word, ga'al, a redeemer, and it's actually plural in the Hebrew. One of our redeemers, because there were, all, there were redeemers. <clears throat> Who could be a redeemer? Everybody, every man was a redeemer, if he had the ability to do it, but he could be a redeemer. 
Remember, everybody could, could, be, could redeem himself. He could redeem land back then. So it's plural. That's why there's many redeemers. Mankind in general is the nearest redeemer because he'd been here all along. The next in line would be a new one who came. And who is the one who came? Jesus came. God in Christ came and took upon himself as a like sinful flesh became a man, remember. So he's going to be the second one. So here it speaks, first of all, that this, this is going to affect not only the living, but also all those ones that are dead. We come to chapter 3. In verse 9. This is when Ruth said, and comes to Boaz, Boaz the type of Christ to accomplish these things. And this is what Boaz says. He says, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. He's referring to him as the kinsman redeemer who could do something for her, which would be to restore her. And she was a widow, remember, and restore her widowhood would, would, hood, and bring forth a child to restore her. So what's she asking Boaz to do? spreading therefore thy skirt over her, this you will see in another place where the same thing is brought forth. It's over in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. He said, Now when I passed by thee and looked upon me, behold, thy time of, was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, Covered thy nakedness, yea, I swear unto thee, enter into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. What's that talking about? A purchase, buying, and entering into a covenant. What this is understood to be is this is a marriage, is what it's talking about. The spreading the skirt over her was a marriage request that she was making. And what happens when the marriage, you enter into a covenant, a co marriage is a covenant, and you become the person who bought you, which was Boaz was going to be buying her. So Ruth was asking Boaz to make the marriage, marry her, to redeem her. as part of the redemption to restore her from her widowhood because she didn't have a child and to also to restore the name of the family to go forth. So in doing this, another thing is important, invoking her right under the laws in order to have a marriage for him to take her as a wife, but also had to restore her widowhood because this was also the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, If brethren dwell together, one of them die, have no child. That's what happened. The wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger, does not go out to somebody else. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her to do what? To raise, bring forth a child in order to continue on the family line. It shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead. It succeeds the one who is dead, not the one who fathered it, this one, the brother. It would be the one who died, which was her husband before, who died. That his name be not put out of Israel. So it would be the firstborn. The firstborn of, that would become the, now the, the child of the one who had died. So it's keeping that name continuing on. And this, of course, would be a firstborn son. So it would cause the family lineage to continue on. This is called Liverite marriage. And what this was, because Ruth had no living child, she's asserting her right of Liverite marriage to Boaz on behalf of her husband to raise up a son according to the laws of Israel. This is exactly what, has to hap what had, had to happen because the Father, Heavenly Father, through Jesus, had to do this very thing. Who died leaving a will, the New Testament, and he's going to have to raise up a son, a firstborn, which is what Jesus became, a brand new person, remember, we got a new spirit, 
That's why he had to go to hell in the spiritually dead state and be born from spiritual death to spiritual life, which is what happened in hell, as we've all pointed out already, and become actually the firstborn of all creation because all creation was spiritually dead. And he had to bring forth the new creation, which is the firstborn of all creation. And that would raise up the what? The new family line of mankind because man was dead. He had to be a brand new family line come forth. And the only one who could do it was God. But he had to get in the position of man and die and then be a firstborn and bring this forth, this new family line of mankind. That would preserve the family line of mankind instead of being in a state of spiritually dead and uh, uh, for, forever, not being able to ever be in relationship with God. This is exactly what Jesus came to do. In Ruth chapter 3, verse 12, this is when she, she says, Now it's true that I am thy near kinsman. Remember, that's where she made the, he had made this uh, uh, request of her, and he, he was going to go forth and do it. He says, Now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people does know that thou art a virtuous woman. Now that tells you another thing. In order for her to qualify for this marriage, which is also pointing towards the mystery as it speaks of in Ephesians 5, which is the marriage between Christ and the church, the church, who is the bride, as the woman, has to be a virtuous woman, meaning she's got to be one who is holy and righteous before God. And we've seen that before. And we'll see it again, that it's of necessity that you have a wedding garment on and you be righteous and you be holy and be sanctified without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish to be presented to him because Ephesians 5 is all talking about presenting the bride to the bridegroom, the marriage. And in order for this to take place, she had to be a virtuous woman, which she was. And so he said, I see you're a virtuous woman. You'll qualify for this marriage. Now it's true that I am thy near kinsman, Boaz, he's talking about, howbeit there's a kinsman nearer than I. And this is all prophetic, pointing towards Jesus, who Boaz is a type of, was a kinsman, but there was a near kinsman. Who is the near kinsman? Mankind in general. The near kinsman is never named because it's not talking about one person. It's talking about mankind in general. So, Jesus, of course, he had to become a man. And remember, he had like sinful flesh as we are. He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He had to walk the walk that Adam had failed. And so, Boaz, a type of this, this kinsman, the next one who has after the nearer kinsman, kinsman. And what does he say he's going to do? Verse 13, he says, Tarry this night, it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee that part of the kinsman, talking about the nearer kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, if this nearer one doesn't do it, then I will do the part of the kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth lie down until the morning. So he's committing to do this if the nearer kinsman couldn't do it or wouldn't do it for some reason. So what is this? This is Ruth, who now is a type of man in a spiritually dead state who's wanting to be redeemed, want to be repurchased back into relationship with God. He tells her that she's to lie down during the night. Well, that's darkness. Man's under darkness. He hadn't come to the light yet. He's in bondage. He can do nothing. That's why she had to lie down. You can't do anything. She just has to stay put. So she's lying down in that state. And then also, he says, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning. It's interesting, the more, word morning is the word boker in the Hebrew, which means the break of day or the time of when the light comes at sunrise. Well, what does that mean? That means when the light comes, that's, the one who's, that's when this is going to be performed by this kinsman redeemer. Who's the light? Jesus. The light came and shined in the darkness. Jesus is coming when he comes into the world he is the one who is going to do this mighty work, is what it is all prophetic of. 
So Boaz is committing to do this work. Now we come to chapter 4, verse 1. Boaz now, he's going to see if, what, what, what needs to be done here. He goes to the gate, sat down there, and behold, the, uh, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. He's not named, remember, because it's all a type of mankind being a kinsman. But remember, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't because he's spiritually dead. But he's got to approach him first to see if he can do it. And remember, after him, then if he can't do it, then, he, then Boaz could take it. He came by unto him and said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city, because this is a legal, legal thing that's going on. You have to sign a legal document when you do this. And he said, Sit down here. And they sat down. He said unto the kinsman, Naomi, it's come again out of the country of Moab, sells a, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there's none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. Meaning, in the succession of redeemers, he's after them, which is what Jesus was. Jesus was a kinsman redeemer, but he came after man was already here, so he would be secondary. And then he says, and he said, I will redeem it. So he's now committing that he's going to do this work. Now, when a widow would request a next of kin to perform this role of the kinsman redeemer, he wasn't forced to do it. He didn't have to do it. He had to meet conditions to do it. And he had to meet those conditions or he wouldn't, of course, he wouldn't be able to do it. First condition, he had to be qualified as a kinsman. Well, this guy's qualified as a kinsman because he's a human being and spiritually dead, just like him. He was a man. Secondly, willing to be able to do it. Well, what did he say? He said, I will redeem it. So he was willing to do it. The third thing is he had to be able to perform this work and accomplish all that was necessary. And this was going to be a legal aspect. A legal document was executed an agreement there to seal the agreement in the presence of all these witnesses. It was a legal aspect according to law that was done. So he says, I'll do it. But now verse 5, look what it says. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, repurchase the land, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Now there's a big mistake here in the King James. Remember, we've told you time and time again, whenever you see a italicized word, it's not in there. Notice it. It's italicized. It isn't in there. It literally says that you must buy, and not of, you must buy Ruth the Moabitess. You're going to buy her, which means the marriage. And it's implying that because you're going to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, which means you're going to have a child. She's going to have a child with him. So this is the purchase by, of not only here of the land, but also of Ruth as his wife. And he was going to raise up a child for the name of the dead upon his inheritance. That's what he's talking about here. So he's going to buy Ruth. They should never have put it. The translator just thought it was talking about it. But they made a mistake. It has nothing to do with it whatsoever. So the two issues are the near, nearer kinsman had to buy the land. Now, he could do that, but he also had to buy Ruth to wife and raise up a son. Well, that would accomplish what was necessary to keep the name of the family continuing on. So, what do we see happen? Verse 6, the kinsman said, kinsman said, this is the nearer one, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my, my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So he says, I, I can't do this. Why couldn't he do this? First of all, the word cannot is a word which means to prevail, to overcome, to have power, to be able to uh, be the victor. Because this is what it's implying prophetically. He didn't have the ability to overcome the situation. And when he talks about marring, or that means to destroy, ruin his own inheritance, 
Why would that be? Because the way the law was, if he would have had married her and had a son, remember, <coughs> whose son is that considered? Not his son, but it would be the dead wife, the dead uh, ma husband of the wife. That becomes her son. Well, if then if he would pass away, everybody pass away, then that son has the inheritance of everybody, including this one who married her. His inheritance would go into his hands. That's why it would destroy his inheritance. And he didn't want to do that. So he says, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to risk the rest of destruction of my inheritance. So he says, redeem my right. And this is this word gula, meaning my right of redemption. So he's giving the right of redemption to the other one, the one who's after him, which is the kinsman redeemer, which is Boaz. The same is true. Man could not redeem man. He could not do what was necessary. And so he had to give it over into the hands of the, ne the, the kinsman redeemer, the next in line. And who was that? That's Jesus is the one who would do it. So from the natural standpoint, he couldn't do this. And we'll come back to this in a moment because there's more to this. In verse 7, look at what it says. Now, this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming. This is the, right, this is the word for right of redemption, gula, and concerning changing. This is the word which means that which is exchanged or the exchange that occurs. And this is the exchange when something is purchased. The purchase, the change of ownership of something from one to another. So, the, what they did was to confirm all things that you were going to sell this, that a man plucked off a shoe, gave it to his neighbor, and this is the testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said to Boaz, buy it for thee. He drew off his shoe, meaning he's giving his right of redemption and for the ownership and the purchase into his hand. And that's what happens. So Boaz said, you're witnesses of this day. I bought all that was Imlimlechs and Chileans and Malans in the hand of Naomi. And also, moreover, Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malan, I purchased to be my wife. This is why you know it wasn't talking about it back there. Remember when I said it's not in there. He's talking about buying Ruth. I have purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren from the gate of his place. So, he is now committed that he's going to be able to do this. That also shows you that redemption involves marriage. It's a purchase. And it's more than just a purchase that when I got born again and I have the same spirit, it's more than that because there's conditions to get to the marriage, the marriage supper of the Lamb, remember. So the one saved, always saved, thinking uh, I got my ticket, everything's fine forever is a lie. There's a whole lot more to be in the marriage. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're in the marriage automatically. In fact, we'll show you one of the scriptures that makes this clear. Matthew. We've talked about this in the past. Matthew 22. Here's this marriage. The king comes to see the guests. There's a man had not on a wedding garment. The word on is the word enduo, which means to clothe oneself. He'd not clothed himself with a wedding garment. The perfect tense describes action completed in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Very important to understand, meaning this guy was supposed to have completed this work in the past with present results now. He'd done it, and that's the way he is, of having put on, clothed himself with a wedding garment. And he's to do it for himself because it's a middle voice. See, tense voice and mood is extremely important to understand what's being said. And we bring this forth all the time. He had to do it himself. You and I are responsible to make sure we have the wedding garment on. See? And so, he said, not friend, he said comrade. This is the word comrade, not the word friend. How camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He's speechless. He's coming to the wedding. 
Is he going to be accepted in the wedding without a wedding garment? No. Look what happens to him. The king said that the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's not in the wedding. Even though he was invited to the wedding, he had a call. Remember, many are called, few are chosen. The ones that are chosen are the ones that respond to the call and do what is necessary. And furthermore, when we come to Ephesians, remember, Ephesians chapter 5 is all about the wedding. It's talking about Christ and the church, just as it talks about the husband and the wife. And it's a mystery, and we'll be talking about this at a later time, but Look what he says. He has, to, he has to sanctify this. The bride has to be sanctified for the bridegroom to receive it. And notice he says that he might present it to himself. Well, that's what the bridegroom is doing when he takes the bride to himself. A glorious church, not having spot, wrinkle, or any such thing, should be holy and without blemish. That's why only the righteous and the holy ones are going to be there. The rest of them aren't going to be there. This is the wedding. And so we're talking about a wedding is also involved in this. And that is so important. Now, when we go back to Ruth, and she has a son now in chapter 4, verse 17. This is after she has the child. The woman, her neighbors, gave it a name saying, this is a son born to Naomi. What do you mean? It wasn't born to Naomi. It was born to Ruth. But remember, it goes to back to the family line. And because Naomi's the living one of that, it's born to Naomi. It's hers. And they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. And that continued on the messianic line. Now, there's also a deeper revelation here that we need to address for a moment. Remember the guy said he, could, he didn't have the prevailing, overcoming power, able to gain victory, to be the victor, to accomplish this work. Well, who would, the kinsman, what, who would this, this redeemer have to gain the victory over from a, from a prophetic spiritual standpoint? It'd be over the devil who had man in bondage. Man was in bondage to Satan. He was a slave to him. He was on his way to hell. So this nearest kinsman, the mankind under the spiritual death, could not gain the victory to conquer Satan because he already had him. He already was in bondage to him. Satan had the keys of hell and death, remember. So who could, who could conquer? Since man couldn't do it, it had to be God. But, God had, but he had to have a man, so God had to become a man. And who's that? That's Jesus who had to come and conquer the enemy. So, Jesus is the one. He's got the right of redemption now, remember. And it's in his hands that he can do something about it. And so, here comes the redeeming and the exchange. Remember what the exchange is. The exchange is the ownership the change in ownership, that something is going to be bought. There's going to be an exchange that is going to occur. And that's exactly what happens when you and I receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior and we get the exchange. Remember what happens when you receive Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that we become a new creature. That's the new creation. Verse 18 says, all things are of God who hath reconciled us. Look at the word reconcile. It's the word to mean change or exchange. The exchange of us to himself by Jesus Christ. And he's given to us the ministry of the exchange. What, what happens? When you receive Jesus, the old spirit is taken out and a new spirit comes in. There's an exchange. You were owned by Satan. But not any longer. That spirit is taken out. It's burn up. That's the fire. Burn up. It's eliminated. 
and the new spirit comes in, which is the spirit of Jesus Christ, and now you're a new creation. You're a firstborn. You're a part of this new, new creation. And that is what has to happen, and that's exactly what Jesus accomplished. The same thing is pointed out over in Romans chapter 5, when it speaks of in verse 10. We were reconciled, exchanged to God by, through, through, this means, the death of His Son, much more being reconciled. Now we have a brand new spirit. We shall be saved through, or, or in, or by His life which means that's going to be an ongoing work. We shall be saved. Because salvation, remember, we talked about it, is you are being saved ongoingly as you're working out your own salvation, doing the Word of God. Now, one other thing we want to, a couple of things that we want to point out yet. Going back to Ruth. And this is tremendous what God has done. Remember, this guy, he could not redeem it. He didn't have the ability, the power, the, the, thought, the means to get the victory to accomplish this prophetically is what it's talking about. So, who's the one who could do it? Jesus. He would accomplish this with the right of redemption, which would bring the achieving of the change of ownership as, and the exchange, which is what this is talking about. And so, how could this be happen? How could this happen? Because he is going to do what's necessary to actually destroy man's inheritance. Remember, what was man's inheritance when he died in the state he was in? Going to hell. <laughs> Stay spiritually dead and he goes to hell. Well, that has to be destroyed. It needed to be destroyed. So what does Jesus come to do? He came to actually to destroy that inheritance and to bring forth a new inheritance for mankind, becoming a firstborn. And one of the things that we see, we looked at the scripture before, but we was to bring this to back to remind you for a moment. In Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, I will ransom them, pada, achieve the change of ownership from the power of hell. Well, that's what he's going to do. So and he just, Jesus, by accomplishing what he did, destroyed the inheritance that man had of going to hell. He reversed it. Remember, Jesus came to reverse the curse. He accomplished that by becoming a curse for us, to overcome the curse, and reverse the curse on man as well as on everything, which eventually he's going to take it back and control the earth as well to deliver him. So he accomplished this tremendous work in order to see us be set free by becoming a firstborn. And remember, Jesus, first Revelation 1.18, he says, I am he that liveth was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. He got them back. Satan doesn't have them anymore. That means once you are born again, you're following the way of the Lord, you aren't going to go to hell now, you're going to go to heaven. He now has delivered us from this and brought us to the place now where we can go to heaven. We aren't, we're, not, we're not going to go in that place anymore unless you reject Jesus, then you're still going to go to hell. But this has been provided and available for every single person. Now, remember what Jesus accomplished after he went to hell for five, three days and three nights, the 72 hours, paying the price, what happened? He was the born from spiritual death to spiritual life. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, Revelation 1.5, and the first begotten, this means the firstborn. He's the firstborn. Of is not right, it's out of. It's a, it's a preposition meaning out of or out from the dead. And the dead is not talking about the state of being dead. This is talking about the dead ones, where the dead ones were. This is the word, a cron for dead ones. It is an adjective, which means you would be describing something of ones, since it's plural. So the dead ones is the way you would translate it 
accurately. So what he's saying is, he's the firstborn out of the dead ones. Where were the dead ones? All in hell, spiritually dead. He's the firstborn out of the dead ones. And what was he bringing forth? Colossians 1.15, and this is what had to happen. He had to destroy the inheritance of mankind of spiritual death and going to hell and being in that state forever. Colossians 1.15, who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of not just every creation, but all creation, as Young's brings it forth. That meant there had to be a brand new family. And remember, that's what was going on back there. We had to restore this family, so we had to get a new firstborn to keep this family going. But prophetically, what Jesus had to do was to get a brand new creation, a brand new family, the firstborn of all creation. And he brought forth that Jesus is the one who accomplished this tremendous work. But he had to do it according to spiritual law. He had to have the right of redemption, he had to have the right of the possession of the inheritance, and he had to have the right for the exchange of ownership, and he got it. He's the one who was able to accomplish all of this tremendous work and to liberate us to bring forth the new creation. Praise God for this tremendous work. He had to do it according to spiritual law and to bring us to the place of being in the marriage. We'll also point this out. Ephesians chapter 5, remember. When it says that he, this is misleading because it's not a good translation according to the Greek. That he might, and remember this was Christ loving the church and gave himself for it. And remember, this is a mystery. A mystery, it was said. You can only get it by revelation of what it's talking about. That he might sanctify it. Now again, does this mean that everybody who is a part of the church is sanctified? No. This is a subjunctive mood verb, which is a conditional statement in the Greek, meaning conditions have to be met for this to be accomplished. That he might sanctify it if conditions are met. <laughs> then it says, and cleanse it. There's no nothing there for it whatsoever. It's a mistake. It's been added. But it most really says, and also is, this is the main verb. The main verb will be, uh, it has a mood like a subjunctive mood or be indicative mood. When we come to the word cleanse, it is not a main verb in this clause. Instead, it is a participle. And we'll show you this. You may not know Greek, but you're going to understand this. This is a participle. What a participle is, is a verbal adjective. And otherwise, it's relating to the main verb. And the way you would translate it, as Young's brings out, that he might sanctify, it might be sanctified, having cleansed, already being cleansed, that it's already been done. And how did he cleanse it? With the bathing, not washing. This is the word lutron, of water by the word. When we receive the word of God, what happens? We get born again by the word of God. What is this washing? It's not talking about us being cleansed as a Christian. This is the cleansing part, the sanctifying. This is what, this is what he does after having been cleansed which is what? With the bathing. Otherwise, we've been bathed in the past already. What's the bathing about? Look at this. It's used two times in the Greek, this word. It is number 3067, just so you can see it. It means bathing. It's been translated erroneously there. Here is the second use of it, and it will tell you what the bathing is. Titus 3.5. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the lutron, 3067, the bathing of regeneration, which is what? That is the new birth. So the bathing is the new birth, where we get born again, the whole person. 
is bathed, not just a washing from sin. That's important to know. The same thing actually is shown over in John 13, another one where people have not understood this at all. This is where Jesus is washing their, talking about washing the feet of the disciples, and they didn't understand what was going on. He said, what I'm doing, you don't even know. You're going to know it until hereafter. He says, if I wash you not, you have no part with me. And this is talking about wash. This is the word wash. Notice, nipto, to wash, below. And so Peter says, well, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. What do the feet speak of? Your walk and where you get in sin. Do we need to do the whole body? No. Jesus said to him, he that is not niptoed, but luo, the word of this, the verb form of this lutron is bathed. He that's been bathed, which is what happens when you get born again, the bathing of new birth, needs not, needs not save except to wash nipto his feet. What are we going to wash? We're going to wa get washed from all the sins we might commit, but we don't need to get bathed again, I mean, get born again again. No. So the point being, as we go back here by showing that to you, is who's going to make it to the marriage? The redemptive work has to be completed in your life, and it's not done. It is a work in progress. That he might sanctify, if they meet conditions, to make it holy, having cleansed it with the bathing, meaning he got born again, in order that, this is a Hena clause in the Greek, in order that, otherwise he's been born again, now that he might cleanse it, if that gets done, he's now holy and everything, that he might present it, in order that he might present it, and again, this is conditional as well, subjunctive mood, it's not automatic, to himself, and what this is, the bridegroom presenting the bride to himself, who's met the conditions, because he's purchasing her. We are being purchased, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. These are the ones that are going to be there in the marriage. Without that, see, the work of redemption is not done. It's an ongoing work. It will be culminated with the ones who've, met, who've come to the place of having it done. They're going to get a glorified body at the rapture, and they're going to go up to the heaven for the marriage because they have already, they're the ones who are righteous and holy and have met the conditions and they're going to be in the marriage with him. They are the ones that are going to be presented to him. And that means it's a work in progress in our life to see the entire redeeming work be accomplished, to restore us, to heal us, to deliver us. All sin has to be dealt with. You've got to come out of everything that's not of God and walk right. And God does the work in you, totally. Remember, you don't have a sinner spirit any longer. You've got a new spirit, a righteous spirit. And sin has no dominion over you. And now you can walk according to the word, walk in spirit, crucify the flesh daily, deny yourself, totally live unto him, do what he says at all times, and you won't be walking in sin any longer. And you're going to go on to perfection, remember. We've talked about that many times, how we go on to perfection. That's the glorious church that's going to be presented to him. It's a glorious, perfected church. That is where we are headed. The tremendous work of Jesus Christ. But notice it had to be done according to spiritual law. And there's another aspect, which is being able to possess the inheritance of the earth, which we're going to talk about tonight, and how he, what he had to do in order to get the inheritance. Because he was not the heir when he came. He had to do all the things that were necessary so that he would become an heir. So he would have the right to the possession of the inheritance of the earth. And that time when he's going to bring forth that act is on the horizon, remember, as we end up the church age, when he's going to open up the title deed to the earth, which you're going to hear about tonight. We'll talk about that. And 
bring forth the repossession of the earth and the conquering of all the enemies and the judgment of all those who have rejected him and the righteous holy ones will be with him and they'll be a part of this end time glorious church. And that is where we are headed at this point in time. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the tremendous work of Jesus Christ who did everything according to spiritual law, according to the laws set forth in the word to accomplish the jubilee, which is the restoration of all things. I thank you for the great work that has been accomplished. And it's being accomplished in my life because I've become a firstborn. And I am seeing the ongoing work of redemption be accomplished in my life to restore me in all areas and come to the place of perfection, a part of the glorious end time church that will have met conditions to be presented as the bride to the gr bridegroom who's going to take me and he's going to give me a new body and he's going to take me to heaven and I'm going to be with him in the marriage supper of the Lamb and I'm going to be with him forever and ruling and reigning when we come back in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this great work of redemption that you have begun, completed part of it. It's ongoing in our life and you will accomplish the whole thing. Thank you for the revelation of it. I will be doing everything your word says so I will be a part of this end time glorious church presented unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, thank you for helping everybody to understand this and the tremendous work that Jesus accomplished and how all the things he did are of necessity to be able to accomplish everything. Thank you for all that you have done and are going to continue to do and what you're doing in our life because all of us are hearers and doers of the word, so we will be a part of this end time glorious church. Thank you for much fruit as we obey you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.